Can you explain about how the lineage from Kim Il Sung sort of through to now has worked? Mm. Because it's quite an interesting story. Yeah, so this is another irony, right? Like in communism, you don't have a king, but North Korea became a kingdom, right? It's a, it's a kings, kings became not just a king, they became a god for North Koreans. They, so interesting about Kim Il-sung is that the first king, his parents were devout Christians. So Kim Il-sung thought, okay, if I copy Bible and tell him, so when you become a god, you don't have to be logical. You don't have to explain why things work the way, right? Like, it's, it's a higher power. Like, you know, you don't try to understand God's logic. So it becomes much easier to brainwashing population. So he literally copied the Bible saying, I'm a God. I love you guys so much. So I'm giving you my son, Kim jong Ye, who's going to work for the, you know, the revolution of the country. But his body dies but don't believe that his spirit is with us forever. Therefore, he can read your thoughts and minds and have many hair in your head. Exactly what the Bible says, right? That Jesus came, he died, and his spirit is with us all the time. And that's how I even believe that kings were like reading my thoughts. I was even afraid to think. People in North Korea, the thought crime, like thinking is not like free. So that's how Kim Il Sung came as a communist. And then he making this country, confiscate all the land, nationalize everything. And he was, I think, more dreamer. He really wanted, thought, I think communism would work. I don't know what he thought, but however, when it came to his son, they knew that this thing is for themselves, obviously. And brutally pur- purge every time the new king comes. And now Kim Jong Un time, the top officials' lifespan is only three years too. So Kim Jong Un is killing everybody every three years, so they don't get corrupt and then consolidate power, so you cannot start a coup. So when you become a top elite, if you're staying there a long time, you are going to consolidate power and get the build allies. But Kim Jong Un execute them and punishing them every three years. By doing that, he get eliminates any competition. Where do you think the paranoia comes from? Is this something that they've been taught by their parents? Have they got a very strong genetic trait for just being unbelievably anxious? What's going on? <laughs> I think they they even know what they're doing is not acceptable, right? Like, I mean, he was killing uh, this top official in a meeting because he was falling asleep in a meeting, and then that guy right next hour get executed in the fire squad. Right. So he knows that people are being royal to him and people are living in that country, not just because they want to live there. It's just out of fear they are doing it. So I'm sure everybody, he knows that so clearly that he's controlling the people through fear only. Nobody loves him. Nobody actually care, take care of him. And nobody wants to be royal to him on their own. So I think in a way that paranoia is legitimate. But he doesn't have to be that way, right? If he tries to make things really better, and why would anybody not want to be there? It's interesting. It's like a vicious cycle when you mistreat people because as you mistreat them, they have less faith in you, which means that you need to use more force in order to get them to comply, which means that they believe in you less, which means you need to mistreat them more, which means you believe in you less. And you can see how this happens. I um, get crazy thinking about... This slow descent as well, as you say, it looks sort of 50 years ago like there might have been a genuine dream that this could have worked with some sort yeah. of a balance. What do you mm-hmm. think What do you think was the worst period for to be alive in North Korea over the last, whatever, sort of 60 years or so, 70 years? Worst period, I think, is definitely the 90s after Soviet Union collapse, right? So in the North Korea began in the 50s. After the World War II, the Japan left, and the Korea became independent, and Korean War begins, and then, of course, America come defend South Korea, so everything departed in 1953. From there on, North Korean economy was heavily subsidized by Soviet Union and China, because that was a Cold War. They wanted the, the communism to win. So they were like, why even the Soviet Union going bankrupt themselves? 
they're heavily subsidized North Korean economy. But when they collapsed in 89, uh, North Korea, that's when they really knew that communism doesn't work. You just spend everybody's money and that's it. Everybody become dirty poor, right? So in the 90s, that's when the regime decided that, okay, the only success measure that we are going to have is keeping the 10% of the population alive. That, for them, is a success. So as long as they maintain 10% alive, they think they do not have to do a thing about it. So until the 90% all die, they're going to do a thing about it. So this is why also they want the population to be weak. Why do they starve us, even though the international community begging North Korea to feed its own people? They want to give money. The UN won't beg to give food, right? But North Korea regime says no to the, all the aids and all the medical aids. And the reason why they do that is that because it's so easy to control people when they're hungry. Like in North Koreans, what we do is that when we get up, we eat the breakfast, right? And what we are thinking is, well, how are we going to find lunch? Once you eat lunch, like, oh, how am I going to make, like, find dinner? If you make the one day, you think, okay, I made the one day on earth. How am I going to make tomorrow? You, tomorrow is never guaranteed for you. You don't know, like, how you are going to be tomorrow. So in that mind, people are very occupied with a survivor. And then, can, then they are not going to even think about what is dictatorship, what is freedom, what is the outside of the world to look like. They don't care about that. And Kim Jong-un have every, every reason to stop the population. And he's using the most inhumane torture to be a god right now. It's very difficult to think about putting a revolution together when all that you need to worry about is your next meal for you and your family. Yeah, it's such a, it's such an effective control mechanism. Obviously, it's awfully brutal, but it yeah. works. It gets the it job works. done of yeah. not permitting any mental freedom for yeah. people to think of those higher abstractions. I mean, you know, for you to think, to be surprised by a day planner, yeah. What's a day planner? Why would I need to plan my day? That's planned by the state. Yeah. Why didn't Kim Jong-il's eldest son become mm. leader? So Kim Jong-il didn't, the Kim Jong-nam who got assassinated, right? So, yeah, that's an interesting story. Uh, Kim Jong-il had four wives, official wives. <laughs> and then like, how many mistresses? We, we don't even know. There's going to be armies of them. So among those four... Kim Jong-nam is coming from the first wife, the rich is a legitimate wife. And he was really loved by Kim Jong-il. Uh, however, around like early 2000, Kim Jong-nam was visiting Japan to go to Disneyland with a fake passport. On the way back, he got caught and journalists took photos of him. And then it became an international like embarrassment. Because North Korea is all about hating the West. Right, hating America, hating Japan, hating the Western civilization. And here is the heir to North Korean throne going to Disneyland. So it was such embarrassment. And that's when Kim Jong Kim Jong il were like almost banished him. And that's how he but the thing is Kim Jong nam was a way more free spirit. He wasn't interested in like power. He wasn't interested in control. He was more interested in like opening up the economy. Let's learn from the West. Let's learn like what we can do better. And he was more like a believer of a Chinese direction that Chinese Communist Party took, which is the opening up the economy. We don't have to change the party, Communist Party, but can we at least open the economy so people get fit, fit fed? But of course, North Korean regime like then no, we don't want that. So his ideology did not meet that what his father dreamed of. And then his third wife, which was also pleasure squad that she was, I think, a dancer. And she had a son, Kim Jong-un, which was a second son, not even the first son. He was very ambitious. He was very brutal and cruel like his own father. So Kim Jong-il saw Kim Jong-un and then like, oh my God, I see myself in you. So you are going to be the next steel leader. And he became one. So the... Kim Jong Nam, I'm trying to keep yeah. up with all of the names here. Mm, mm. He um he was misaligned to be the sort of leader that everybody needed in any case. Do you yeah. think cuz he was killed only a yeah. couple of years ago. He was assassinated. Mm. Um yeah. but it seems like 
the trip to Japan was a convenient excuse for somebody that probably didn't meet the criteria to be a leader in any case. Yeah, no, he wasn't going to be that brutal and kill the uncle. Like literally Kim Jong-un is way more brutal than any previous Kims. He used uh, this like aircraft that shoots down the airplane. He used that to execute people. So it makes the people become a dust, literally. Like you become into pieces of this blood and like that's a thing. That's how it executes people and to show the actual terror. And But as you said, right, you got to use more fear as the time goes by. And more fear and fear and fear and there's no ever ending to it. And Kim Jong-un, like literally when he executed his own uncle, said he has no place to be buried in this land. So make him into dust. That's why he they used the aircraft that gone almost to shoot him down, so he became into pieces, and nobody could collect his bodies. Afterwards. What was the uh, what was the outcome? Because he got was it a nerve agent in Singapore or Japan or something? No, Malaysia. Malaysia. Oh, so that was a bro- that was a brother, but the uncle when Kim Jong Un was killing his uncle. But like Kim Jong Nam's case, like the nerve agent that they wrapped in his nose and face, and then he just died within a few minutes. And his body was sent to Pyongyang afterwards, and we don't know what they did with his body, but he was killed in the. And it it was so sad because he was providing information to the U.S. intelligence for the last ten years, and then U.S. didn't do a thing about protecting him. Like he was on that trip meeting a CIA agent in the northern island of Malaysia for two days. After he was giving all the information, and when he was about to go home back to his family. They killed him, and this is so sad. Like nobody protects anybody at this point. Did you hear the story of why the two women that rubbed the rag in his face did it, or yeah. why they said? Yeah. So they claimed that they were that they'd been told that they were doing a prank on a TV show. Yeah. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they told, oh, this is going to be some prank TV show. This makes no sense. I mean, these girls were like not touching themselves the thing they were going washing their hands like very carefully that i mean if that was a prank why would they do that so but the thing is point is that i think even those girls were victims they were i don't i don't really don't think that's so important they knew or not the most important thing is how there is no revenge or no accountability no justice, when the, no. you know but even jamal kashuki the saudi journalist we all know that when he got chopped off into pieces in the Saudi Council in Turkey, there's no consequences for killing a dissident. That is the world that we are living in. Like, of course, people talk about injustice all the time, but this is a clear injustice. These are clear murderers. Well, it's a good control. No... It's a great control mechanism, right? If, mm-hmm. as a dissident, you know that not only are you probably going to be killed, but that yeah. the people that are going to kill you aren't going to be brought to account. And the more yes. that this happens, the more that dissidents, killers aren't put on trial or aren't called to account for the things that they've done, the more fear it instills in people that want to speak out against regimes yes. that need it, and the more it empowers the regimes that want to control their population. Absolutely. I mean, when, the, when Putin like, poisons his dissidents, I mean, when NBS, yeah, Saudis do that, North Koreans does that, like even... There's really no accountability at this point. And this is, uh, I think, one of the justice area that we are struggling. And I think that this is, I don't know how to even solve this. But the thing is, what a joke. The I mean, Saudis and Chinese and Russians deciding who are the human rights violators at the UN. So this is a, almost a joke to me that Michael Malice, is a joke. Michael Malice will have a solution for this. He's always got yeah. a solution for, for mad anarchy, law shit yeah. in different countries. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace. <laughs>